good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I've been involved in NCARF since really before it started, so it's great to see it going from strength to strength. It's been a long morning, so if you all want to have a wiggle, um, please feel free to do so. Um, it's been my great privilege to be a member of the Climate Commission um, for the last year and a half, and I'd just like to share with you some thoughts about, well, some, some information about what we've been doing and some thoughts. Um, I won't be specifically talking much about adaptation, so in a sense I'm a bit of an odd one out on this stage. Um, however, as both Blair and Simon have pointed out, understanding of climate change and its impacts is really a fundamental underpinning to good adaptation policy. So who are we? Well, the Climate Commission was an election promise by the Gillard government at the last election. We formed in February last year. There are six climate commissioners from a range of different backgrounds. So going across that photo there, Will Stephan, who many of you will know, climate scientist from ANU, Roger Beale, former secretary of the Department of the Environment and an economist now with PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, that's me. Uh, Tim Flannery, who, of course, you will all know as a paleontologist and science communicator. Susanna Elliott, the head of the Science Media Centre in Adelaide. And Jerry Houston, um, an oil man of 34 years' experience, former chief executive of BP Australasia. Susanna has stepped down a couple of months ago and has been replaced by Veena Sahajwala, who's in that bottom photo, who is a materials engineer and an expert in sustainability. Uh, Tim is our Chief Commissioner. Um, we've all been appointed for an initial period of two years and we're supported by a science advisory panel um, of expert climate scientists, many of whom are here today and I thank you for your work, um, and a very dedicated and hard-working secretariat provided by the Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Our terms of reference when we started um, were these, to provide an independent and reliable source of information about the science of climate change, international action being taken to reduce emissions, and the economics of a carbon price. And I've emphasised the word independent there uh, because there's, there's a lot of um, confusion about our role um, and we have to always stress that we do not answer to the minister nor do we advise the government. We are funded by the government but independent of them. Before we began, we received uh, a presentation by CSIRO who had done some survey work about six months prior, so in July 2010, about attitudes to climate change. And we, I'm going to put up a couple of the figures to just sort of serve as a benchmark of the sort of prevailing attitudes of when we started. So firstly, is climate change happening? Um, and over 80% of the population surveyed said, yes, indeed it was. Uh, with the rest saying, no, it wasn't. What best describes your thoughts about climate change? Well, there was a, a re relatively small rump of people who said, no, climate change is not happening, or I don't know. Um, a larger group, about 40%, that believed that climate change was happening but were not convinced about a human cause of it. And then about 50 or so percent of the population said, yes, climate change is happening, we believe the science and humans are responsible. And I want to come back to this figure at the end because I've, after the last 18 months of talking to people around the country, um, I have a few reflections about this pie diagram. People were also surveyed as to who they trusted to give them information and there'll be many people in the audience that will be very gratified to see that the most trustworthy people were university scientists. Um, the least were oil companies, not really surprising, um, but environmental organisations, environmental scientists and government scientists were all up there in the trusted group, which is good. People were also asked what they thought of current uh, federal government policy at that time. Remember, this is nearly two years ago. Um, over 50% of people surveyed believed that the government was not doing enough. Um, about a quarter thought that they were doing the wrong thing, um, with the rest saying, yes, they're doing enough or they're doing too much. So what do we do? 
Well, we do a number of things. Our main activity is to go around the country conducting community forums um, and holding discussions, real town hall meetings, literally often in town halls, with the public about climate change. We also publish reports, um, hopefully um, written in a style that is understandable by the lay public about climate science and its impacts. We provide resources via a website, I'll give some details later. And we've also been bringing out international scientists as well as national scientists to um, enter into those conversations with not only the public but with business leaders and policy makers. So what have we done? Well, last year we set a really cracking pace. We started in February and by November we had already conducted 14 public forums. Um, that pace just about killed us last year. I live in fear of my university actually finding out how often I'm not in my office. Um, now we have now he held 16 of these public forums attended by about 3,500 people. We've held dozens of meetings with business leaders and policy makers, community representatives, about 900 people at last count. Um, we present often to industry fora and community groups. And we hope we've connected with many more people, in hopefully millions of people, via the media and via our website. Um, these are the locations of the fora that we've held so far. We've been to every state and territory. Um, we've been dividing our time uh, between the major capital cities, but also those regional centres that, for one reason or another, um, have a particular interest in climate science. Some of those areas are coastal um, centres that are already seeing the impacts of coastal erosion, and others are centres that are particularly carbon intensive, uh, places like Ipswich, which is a coal mining region, places like Bunbury and Geelong, who are highly industrialised, uh, the Latrobe Valley and Playford in South Australia, who are, um, host coal-fired power stations. So we've been trying to get out amongst people for whom climate change um, is uppermost in their minds. So how do they like us? Well, the overall feedback has been very good, I'm glad to say. Uh, when we conduct these forums, we give out feedback forms and we ask people to fill them in. Obviously, it's a self-selected group that actually fill them in. But those that do fill them in, um, if you look at the bottom two bands, each of those bands is a different public forum, and the bottom two bands are the people that rated the overall event as very good or good. And as you can see, um, between about 85 and 95% of respondents respond in that way. Um, not all of them, of course, and it depends a little bit on the place. Um, they actually, you know, for example, liked us more in Geelong and Bunbury, um, which are two of the most industrialised areas, which is quite surprising, perhaps, than they did in Port Macquarie or Ipswich. So the demographics of particular locations um, do uh, affect the feedback that we get. But this is the really important thing for us about what these forums are doing. We ask people whether the event has given them any new information or influenced their thoughts on climate change. We don't ask them how it's influenced, um, but nonetheless, we're looking to have some sort of impact. And the bottom two colours, the red and the grey, are those that say, yes, it's influenced me um, a little or a lot. Uh, the black bits on top are people that say it hasn't influenced me, but that, of course, will include people that are already convinced. These are the sorts of questions we get. Every forum is different. Um, every um, array of questions is a bit different, but there's also a lot of commonality uh, in the things that people want to know. So in the science, you know, isn't this just natural variability? Some of the questions are more sophisticated, um, indicating an actual knowledge of, of some areas of climate science. For example, doesn't CO2 lag behind temperature rather than lead it in the geological record? Um, and often this question is one um, directed to Tim, who's been widely misquoted, of course. Uh, you said Sydney would run out of water. Why are the dams full? We also get a lot of questions about the media. Um, why does the media still portray this issue as a debate? 
A lot of questions, of course, uh, especially recently about carbon pricing. Um, for example, what good is 5%? Um, why are we damaging our economy when the rest of the world is not acting or China is not acting or India is not acting? They're very frequent questions. We get asked a lot of questions about energy, particularly renewable energy and the problems perceived with um, solar power providing baseload uh, power. We're asked a lot about coal seam gas and about the possibility of nuclear energy. Um, but very, very commonly, we're also asked, what can I do as a person in my household and my community? Um, as I said, a number of uh, publications have been produced by the Commission. There's been two major reports, one called The Critical Decade, which is our mantra um, to um, increase the, the feeling of urgency amongst the Australian public, put together by Will Steffen. Um, it's being presented there in that photo to the Prime Minister. Um, you'll see in that photo she's looking a little bit dubious about it, I have to say. Um, uh, that's my sleeve there over on the right. I've been cut out of all the photos, so you'll have to take my word for it that I was there. Um, but importantly, this report was released last May and received support by all major political parties. It was, it was received in a bipartisan way, which was very gratifying. We've also released seven regional reports about climate change impacts and also some short reports about particular issues, such as the recent La Nina event and the, the relationship between weather and climate, which is a source of much confusion. I do want to say just a little bit about adaptation and actually echo some of the, uh, the words that, that Wendy just spoke about. Um, one of the things we've been doing is visiting lots of local councils around the country. Um, and I want to use the example of Clarence City Council in Hobart as an example of a, of, a, of a group of people that are really at the forefront of adaptation planning, um, but are also facing difficulties such as uncertainties about their legal liability vis-a-vis -vis the state government. So Clarence City Council has put together um, what is probably one of the, the most advanced um, adaptation plans for um, their local region and they are currently undergoing extensive community consultation where they are indeed drawing lines on the map and talking about those lines with the local community and taking a lot of flack for it. Um, but they are an example of, of, as Wendy said, where the rubber hits the road in local adaptation planning. Um, from a personal perspective, and I won't uh, pretend to represent the, the views of all the commissioners, but I think mostly they would agree with me, just wanted to say a few things about what I've picked up over the last 18 months. Firstly, there are certainly climate deniers out there, but I don't think they, there are as many or as negative as the media chooses to portray them. There is very still very significant confusion about climate science, as Blair just referred to, um, and also about the impact of carbon pricing. There is a real frustration amongst the Australian public about the lack of bipartisan political approaches to climate change, and certainly some frustrations with some sections of the media at creating a debate where often none exists. But we've also learnt that the sort of catastrophic predictions that many of us, and I work on impacts, so I'm um, as at fault as anybody, those sort of catastrophic predictions that we get up and talk about often, even at forums like today, um, tend to turn the public off. Um, there's all sorts of good psychological reasons why denial is a very protective response when people are faced with things that they're worried about. Um, and I think if, if, if I've learnt nothing else, it's that we need to reframe the way we deliver a lot of our climate science messages. But there's also this great thirst out there for positive action. People want to know what they can do. Uh, they want to know about opportunities um, in their local communities. Um, and this is especially the case in regional areas. And we've been really blown away at times by how regional communities are getting together to do all sorts of things about climate change mitigation and adaptation. 
So if I come back to this pie chart now that I showed at the beginning um, with two-year-old data, um, I kind of look at this pie chart a little bit differently than what I looked at, how I looked at it 18 months ago. The small rump of people, I think, that uh, don't believe that climate change is happening um, and are, are vehemently opposed to any sort of action do um, sort of suck the life out of you a bit. And I think we have to kind of move on from that because um, the sort of time and energy that we spend on trying to convince people that are in some cases incoherent with rage uh, whenever the word clim climate change is mentioned, um, I think it's a waste of time and we need to move past that. The 40% the or so that believe that climate change is happening but are not yet convinced about it, we need to just communicate the science better to those people. Uh, and we are getting through to some of them. Um, but it's actually, the important thing is that 50% or so, or well, hopefully more than that now, um, that are on side. Um, the Commission's often sort of accused of preaching to the converted, and um, it's sort of given to us as an insult sometimes. But the more I think about it, it's the converted that are the people that are going to take action. So in lots of ways, I think that's where our focus should be, not trying to convince the last rump of people um, about the science, but about taking the group that really are on board and working with them to do positive things. Finally, for the rest of this year, um, we have public forums planned for Melbourne at the end of July here, uh, Brisbane, Perth and several other regional centres, um, hopefully Newcastle um, and somewhere in North Queensland, possibly Darwin. Um, we're going to be releasing at least two more major reports. One of them is on international action on climate change, what indeed other countries are doing, and indeed other countries are doing a lot um, to counter that widespread view that Australia is somehow going out alone. Um, and we really want to put out towards the end of the year an opportunities um, report um, really presenting a very positive message to, for those people that really want to do something. Um, we'll be putting out several more uh, regional and state-based impacts reports. Um, our website is currently undergoing a revamp, um, but we're hoping that that will provide an ongoing resource um, for anybody that wants to see it. So please go to that website. Thank you very much.